You may take your seats this morning. Good to see you all. Whose phone is this? Come on, Jordan. I don't want to read your texts in the middle of, of the sermon this morning. I get distracted easily enough as it is. I don't need even more distractions in my life. Um, isn't it exciting? Grid fest in a couple of weeks, Dave. Um, where, you, you looked really good on that video. I was uh, looking sharp, looking good. Nice, nice, nice. It's about as good as I look on videos, I think, uh, as well. Um, it's going to be awesome. We are excited about it. We love Dave. He has done so many incredible things in this community. And uh, doesn't it just warm your heart when you see people really live selfless lives and live it in their purpose, in their calling? There's something so inspirational about that. So we honor you, sir, and uh, I hope it's going to be, and I know it's going to be awesome. All righty. Um, week, I don't know what week we're in. Week something. Week something something. Um, we are talking about feelings. Who's starting to feel a little confused? Anybody? Um, I'm starting to realize that you shouldn't dive too deep, maybe, into the feelings. It can stir stuff up. But this week, we're talking about something that I really thought was going to be easy peasy. We are talking about, actually, let's put it up. Let's put it up on the screen. Let's put up the old wheel. There it is. There's the old pizza. Fantastic. And this week, as we rolled the, uh, the feeling wheel, we landed on, drum roll, anger, ladies and gentlemen. We landed on angry, and, uh, you know, I spoke a little bit to Pastor Jacob in the week, and I said, man, I, I feel not angry at all. I feel pretty good. Uh, might feel a little lonely, might feel a little sad, maybe a little hurt at times, but angry? Think I'm good. Don't feel angry. And it's one of the questions I ask myself every week. As I get up on the platform, I go, is this something I am dealing with? So I said to him, how are you feeling? You feeling angry? And he said to me, no, I don't really feel angry either. I'm like, there we go. We're just two peaceful guys trying to do this thing. And then we looked further into the wheel and we went, I definitely don't feel angry, but I definitely do feel skeptical. Definitely don't feel angry, but I definitely feel a little critical. Definitely don't feel angry, but I definitely get a little grumpy from time to time. Um, I definitely am not angry, but I definitely do feel frustrated. I'm definitely not angry, but I definitely feel a little irritated at times, impatient at times, um, resistant at times, pessimistic at times. So I'm definitely not angry, I just am everything that describes anger, is what I'm trying to say to you this morning. So at deeper investigation, I realized that maybe there is a little bit more anger in my life than I would like to think. And I want to say to you this morning, I think that there is a lot of anger out there right now. Um, I think we are angry as people, and I think we are living in an angry culture And I think we are living during a very angry time. And I believe this morning, this message is right on cue. One of my daughters works at a local grocery store, and she absolutely loves it. Um, She's 16 years old. She now has more money in her actual bank account for spending on a weekly basis than I do. Um, So I'm feeling frustrated. Um, But nonetheless... Uh, I picked her up the other day after a shift, and I said to her, how did it go? And she said to me, well, it was, a little, it was a little weird. And I said to her, why do you say that? And she says, well, I almost got into a fist fight. <laughs> and I said, to her, <laughs> I said to her, okay, why? Why did you almost get into a fist fight? Well, she was working the till, and a lady came with a big sort of grocery cart, and there was over $200 of things in the cart, And when all the sort of maths were done and everything was put through the system, there was an 83 cent discrepancy. The lady did the calculations on her phone in the sort of aisles. Uh, The teller did what it needed to do. And there was an 83 cent discrepancy. This lady was was a little older. They started getting into it. And it literally ended with the lady saying to my daughter, let's take this outside. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we're going to go outside and we're going to fight. We're going to fist fight outside in the parking lot. Now, what's amazing to me is, is you'll see boxing fights 
where millions of dollars are involved and boxers will cancel fights over $100,000 discrepancies in Lake County, ladies and gentlemen. We will bare knuckle fight each other next to the dumpsters in the parking lot for 83 cents. Can you imagine the scene pulling up? <laughs> this is going on. Um, thank goodness they did not fight is the good news. But I think the truth of the matter is, is that we are angry and there is a lot of anger out there. So what I want to do today is, is I want to look at all things anger and hopefully as we work through this together, we can get to a place where we have some tools in the toolbox to deal with anger. So the first thing that I want to look at this morning is a very simple question. Is it a sin to be angry? Um, one of the things that you've heard us say throughout this series repeatedly is that emotions are neither good nor bad. They just are. But anger is an interesting one. So can, are we saying then that it's wrong to be angry, that it's bad to be angry, or that it's a sin to be angry? And I want to answer that question by looking at a couple of verses. First one I want to look at here is Psalm 7, verses 11. This is speaking about God, and it says this, God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. I don't know if that one's popped up on your morning devotional app uh, lately, um, but there it is. Uh, next scripture I want to look at this morning is Nahum 1 verses 2 to 6, and it's the Lord's anger against Nineveh. It says this, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. Haven't heard this scripture put in a praise song just yet, uh, but maybe we will do so. Um, let me say this to you. Two things I want to say to you this morning is firstly is this. Do not let, let, do not let God's grace mislead you. Our God is a fierce, awesome, mighty, powerful God. It's the first thing we need to understand, and he is not to be trifled with. The next thing that we need to understand here this morning is that our God is a holy God incapable of sin. God cannot sin. So if we ask ourselves the question this morning, is it a sin to be angry? The logical thing to do is to take a look at, well, does God ever get angry? And as we can see in Scripture here this morning, it's clear to see that there are times where God gets angry. Therefore, this morning, I want to let you know that it is not a sin in and of itself, to have emotions of anger. As a matter of fact, it can actually be a very natural thing. The question just is this this morning, what are we going to do with those emotions and with those feelings? Ephesians 4 verses 26, it is not a, it is not a sin to be angry, but then what is sinful? This is what Ephesians says, in your anger, do not sin. Can you see how those two things are separated, but they still live in the same neighborhood? And in other words, it is not a sin to be angry in and of itself, but when you are angry, be aware of the fact that you can possibly sin at that point. So when you are angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down whilst you are still angry. So there's a couple of incredible scriptures that we've already read this morning. And simply based out of what we've already seen in scripture, I want to throw four things at you quickly before we move on in regards to anger this morning. First thing that I want to throw at you is this. 
It is not a sin to feel angry. We've established that this morning. That's number one. Number two, we should be slow to anger. This, uh, this, this portion of Scripture that we just read, it speaks about God's wrath. It speaks about God's anger. And it literally says that the Lord is slow to anger. I want you to understand this morning that God's anger is perfectly justified anger. God gets angry at unrighteousness. God has every right to be angry, yet the Bible tells us even in the face of justified anger, God is slow to anger. God does not lose his temper in the drive through when the McFlurry machine is broken again. <laughs> there are just days, though, where I can taste that McFlurry, and when they tell me that thing is broken, I'm like, I'm ready to burn McDonald's down. <laughs> Next thing, we should not sin when we are angry. And then the last one here that I want to look at is we should not stay angry. The Bible actually says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. As we look at this, it becomes clear that it is fine to experience the emotions of anger, but we should not be people that live in a state of anger. Let me say it a little bit differently. It is okay to get angry. I don't think it's okay to be angry. It's okay at times to feel emotions of anger, but if you are living your life in a state of anger, where there is this underlying anger in you all the time, I don't think that that is what the Lord wants of us. I don't think that is where we should live, and I don't think that is where we should stay. We need to move beyond that place where we are constantly feeling angry about everything. I put down here in my notes that we should not be volcanoes waiting to abrupt. There will be moments when things happen that rightfully make us angry, but we should not be people that have this underlying anger boiling on the, on the bottom all the time, simply waiting to erupt. What I really want to look at, though, this morning is this. I want to look at the difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger. I think we've established that anger is not a sin in and of itself, but did Jesus get completely, did he actually get upset? Did he actually get angry? We know in the Old Testament that God at times got angry, but as I was doing the study this week, I thought to myself, well, I think people might hear this and go, but that was Old Testament God. He was angry. He was a little grumpy. Jesus was cool, and he never got angry. So let's maybe see if Jesus ever gets angry. And what I want to do is, is I want to distinguish between what I believe to be righteous anger and unrighteous anger. And we're going to do this by looking at Jesus. So come with me to John 2, 13 to 22. Uh, and, and you know this story fairly well. Uh, I believe you've heard this before, but li listen to this. It says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jewish we uh, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all of this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. So in this moment here, we can see that... Uh, they are absolutely abusing the temple. What's happening is, is people are coming in, and as uh, Jews are coming for the Passover, as they are coming to make sacrifices, as they are trying to make amends with God, as they are trying to do the right thing, people are literally making a mockery of the system. 
They are making a mockery of God's holiness, and they are taking people um, that are coming with good intentions. They are manipulating them, and they are using them. It is in this moment where Jesus gets angry. And I want to say to you today that you can see this in the Gospels. Jesus gets angry when it comes to sinning against God and injustice being committed against innocent people. Righteous anger comes and happens when there is sin against God and when there is justice being committed against innocent people. As Christ followers, we are totally appropriate, getting upset over sin too. Evils such as abuse, racism, pornography, and child sex trafficking should incense us. We should get upset, and we should get angry when it comes to sin and when it comes to innocent people and God's people being used and abused. I want to show you a couple of things out of this that I find interesting. One of the things that I find interesting is, is that the, the scripture we just read, it actually says that Jesus took the time to sit down and to fashion a whip. Now, let me start off by saying this to you. I have never fashioned myself a whip. Um, maybe one day I will, but I never have. But I would assume that it can be time-consuming, and I would assume that you have to be in a fairly calm state of mind to fashion a good old-fashioned whip. Jesus, in this moment, when he gets angry, he does not react out of frustration, but rather he takes action out of passion. Big difference there. There's a big difference between feeling emotions of anger and reacting in frustration in the moment and feeling anger and unrighteousness and actually taking the time to take action in a godly, appropriate way. Jesus does this in the right way. He is angry. He is justifiably angry, but he does not react in frustration because that could lead to sin. He actually takes his time and he reacts in, the, in, a, in an appropriate way. The other thing that we see that's interesting is, is that Jesus does not mix his words in this moment. Notice that he doesn't get sarcastic. <laughs> he doesn't get passive aggressive. Um, he doesn't wait until two weeks later when we're all praying and then he says a weird prayer that kind of shows that you're unhappy with the person but you're praying for the person, right? I've noticed with Jesus when it comes to conflict, Jesus is a straight shooter. He is open and he is honest. I love that. I love how Jesus deals with conflict. And I actually think that one of the things that we struggle with, I think one of the reasons we sin in our anger is I think we are so bad at confrontation, just as people, um, that what we want to do is, is in our moments of frustration, in our moments of anger, we don't want to do anything, but we also then don't want to address it later on in the right way or the appropriate way. So what we do is, is we just keep pushing it down. Keep pushing it down. Keep pushing it down. It's like my garage at the house. Just throw stuff into that garage. It is just, it's the size of 17 football fields. Throw anything in there until one day no more can go into the garage. And that is how we sometimes deal with conflict. And then what happens is, is that volcano starts to erupt and you then end up saying things and doing things that are inappropriate that you did not mean, all because you weren't open and honest in the moment when you needed to be open and honest. So we see some incredible things here from Jesus as he has a righteous anger. I want to show you another moment in Scripture where Jesus gets angry. Let's see if we can see any connections here, anything that we can put together. This is Mark 3, verses 1 to 6. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger. Jesus is angry and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. 
Then the Pharisees, uh, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the, the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. First things first, as we look for correlations between these two stories, notice that Jesus gets angry every time he goes to the synagogue. Synagogue is a little bit like church, right? So, <laughs> so Jesus gets angry at church the most. Um, I can relate to this. But what we can see here is, is that they try to set a trap for Jesus. They're trying to use this man who has a shriveled up hand, and they're trying to use him as a pawn to catch Jesus and to put Jesus in a difficult position. Jesus gets so upset and he gets so angry at the fact that they're using this man and they're trying to trap him that he does what he's going to do anyways. He heals this man. But I can see correlations between these two moments in these two stories. In both cases, we see Jesus get angry when it comes to sin towards God. And in both cases, we can see Jesus getting angry when it comes to injustice towards people. I want to say to you this morning that a righteous anger, a godly anger is an anger that comes from that place where we are angry and we are upset about the sin that is killing and destroying people in this world. And it comes from a place where we get angry when people are being used and abused. In both those, in both those cases, Jesus gets a righteous anger. So this morning, what I now want to do is, is I want to shift on and I want to look at, well, if there is a righteous anger, perhaps there is an unrighteous anger. Perhaps there is an anger we experience that is not so justified, and I want to take a look at that. But before I do that, I want to read you something that I found this week online, and it says this about anger. It says, feelings of anger arise due to how we interpret and react to certain situations. Everyone has their own triggers for what makes them feel angry. But some common ones include situations in which we feel threatened or attacked, frustrated or powerless, like we've been invalidated or treated unfairly, like people are not respecting our feelings or our possessions. As I read through this this week, I realized that essentially there are two things that will motivate a different kind of anger in us. The first one is when we feel like we are losing control. When we feel like we are losing control, we can very easily become angry. The second reason I believe that we get angry is when we feel like we are being judged in some way, shape, or form, and we have to defend ourselves. So I read that in the week, and I thought to myself, well, that is very reasonable, um, I can see multiple situations in which I would get angry under these circumstances. But then I thought to myself, let me go find an instance in Scripture where I believe Jesus has every right to be angry. And let's see how he responds. We know that he can get angry because we've seen it in the Gospels. But let's see if he gets angry in this situation. Come with me to Matthew 26, verse 47 to 55. As I was preparing this week, I just thought to myself, I would get angry in this situation. And it says this, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with him. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi and he kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, my friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But now then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, I, am I leading a rebellion 
that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me. Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place, that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Talk about an antagonistic situation. I take you back to my daughter who almost had a fight in the parking lot over 83 cents. I feel like this is a justifiable reason for a good old-fashioned fight. When I look at this situation, I think to myself, I am the Peter in this story. You touch my Jesus, I cut your ear off, and then I cut your foot off, okay? <laughs> we're going to go to war, we're going to go to fight, but what we see is something remarkable. We see Jesus be absolutely calm in the situation, and it's really perplexing for me because we just read of two occasions where Jesus got upset and where Jesus got angry. Now in this moment, he is personally attacked. It doesn't get more personal than this. Judas betrays Jesus. How insulting, how irritating, right? He walked with Judas. Yeah, one of the guys that was with him betrays him. I, I think about it and I get angry. I'm like, you little, I just want to strangle you. Come over here, right? Judas betrays him. He's now being arrested. We know from Scripture that Jesus is innocent. Jesus is holy. Jesus is not guilty of anything. This is an injustice. This is unacceptable. But for some reason, Jesus, the same Jesus who got angry when they were sinning against God, the same Jesus who got angry when they were sinning against people, now when it is about him, when it's personal, somehow he's calm. Peter responds in the most appropriate way I can imagine. Peter is angry. Peter is upset. Peter wants to justify Christ. Peter wants to justify himself. Peter wants to regain control of the situation. Peter wants to make himself appear big and strong and tough in order to get the situation back to a place where it needs to be. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus remains unbelievably calm. And I thought to myself, well, what, what is this? Like, why, why, why is it that Jesus will get upset when it comes to other people, but then when it comes to injustice towards him, he seems to be calm? Why is that? Maybe it's just because of this particular moment. And that's what I started thinking as I was preparing. I thought to myself, well, it says here that all of this had to take place in order for Scripture to be fulfilled. So maybe I'm misreading the situation. Maybe I'm trying to put doctrine on an isolated incident that is not applicable for all of us. And I started feeling really happy. I was like, yes, no, this is good. I like this. Jesus in this one particular moment did not respond in anger when he was done an injustice to, but I am still very much justified in getting angry if anybody irritates me. Hallelujah. Then I thought to myself, let me go see if Jesus says anything else about this. If there's silence, maybe we can move on. But let's see if there's anything else he actually says about this in a way that would affect us. And I'm going to warn you right now, this is offensive the portion of Scripture I'm going to read you now. This kicks against the grain. This kicks against every little bit of blood that boils in your veins. But I'm going to read it to you, and Jesus said it. Luke 6, verses 27 to 36. So when Jesus does not defend himself in that moment, is it just a one-off moment, or is this actually something Jesus believes? Listen to this. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Good, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Okay, pause. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Love your enemies. That looks cool. Yeah, I can put that on a bumper sticker. Cool, love them. Love them from a distance. Yay, the enemies. Okay, cool, got it. Okay, what else does it say? If someone slaps you on one cheek, <laughs> okay, then you punch them in the stomach. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn them the other also. What? If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Do not even dare come up here and ask me for my jacket. I'm not taking my shirt off. It's not happening. 
Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? (laughs) Dave Ramsey is going to have a heart attack when he reads this, right? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and you will be children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful. Here it is. This is it. This is the key this morning. Be merciful just as your Father has been merciful towards you. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Do we just want to read that and move on to the next passage of Scripture? But this is radical. And in this moment, as we look at it, we see two sort of contrary things here. We see Jesus get angry, and we see Jesus take action when it comes to sin against God and when it comes to sin against others. But in this moment, when Jesus is actually in a position where he is being done an injustice to, he is completely calm. And then we see Jesus go as radical as to say that if somebody slaps you in the cheek, turn to the other one and let them have another shot at it. Now, before we get into all kinds of weird stuff, I want to make this very clear. This scripture is not talking about defending your life. Jesus is not saying thou shall not defend your life if your life is in danger. But he is talking about the fact that there will be times where your comfort is challenged. There will be times where you are challenged. There will be times where your understanding what control is will be challenged. And in those moments, the answer is not to be filled with rage. I will say to you, though, that nothing is more enraging than a slap. That I will tell you. I have slapped and I have been slapped. Um, I remember when I was in high school, I was sitting on the bus one day, and somebody decided to start flicking my ear. (laughs) I'm just going to tell you right now. That is sinful behavior. God disapproves of ear flicking. So this guy just kept flicking and flicking and flicking and flicking. And I got up and I just saw blood red and I slapped this kid so hard that the spit flew onto the bus. When I opened up my eyes, it was the rugby captain. He was the biggest, baddest guy in the world that I just slapped through the face. But apparently he was a Christian because he just sat quietly and behaved himself, which was interesting. Um, On another occasion, I got slapped. I was at a water park, and a girl came up to me out of nowhere. I had never seen her before in my life. She slapped me through the face, and she said, you're disgusting, and she ran off. (laughs) I've just always had such a good rapport (laughs) with people. My friends looked at me, they're like, what's up? And I'm like, don't hate the player, bro, hate the game. Try to be all tough, but I think she had me mixed up with Brad Pitt. We look (laughs) similar. But a slap is not going to kill you. A slap is not going to end your life. But a slap will most definitely put you in a position where where you are being threatened. A slap will put you in a place where you will feel uncomfortable. A slap will put you in a place where you feel like you are losing control. And what is interesting is is that it, it would appear to me that righteous anger has to do with sin against God and sin against others. Unrighteous anger is the anger that is connected to self. It happens when we feel like we are losing control or we feel we are being treated unjustly. Both of these motivations, I believe, come straight from the fall. If you think about Scripture and if you look back to Adam and Eve, The minute they fall, the minute they stumble, the minute sin enters into the world, we see two things happen very quickly. They start blaming one another is the first thing that you see. They start to justify each other. Um, You know, uh, the the snake, um, Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the snake. The snake didn't have a leg to stand on. Um, We see a lot of blame (laughs) shifting going on. 
And then the second thing that we see happen is they try to make fig leaves. They try to cover themselves up. They try to justify themselves. There is an unrighteous anger that is connected to your control, that is connected to your comfort, that is connected to you feeling like you have to justify yourself that I believe is an unjustified anger. And I think it happens quickly, and I think it happens without you even realizing it. I'll give you a quick example of feeling like you are under attack or feeling like the world is against you. Yesterday, I looked at the TV guide, and I saw a rugby match happening at a certain time in the day. It was the one I wanted to watch this weekend. There were a couple of new guys playing. I was so excited about this. So I very sneakily, because I'm sneaky, I'm sneaky like that, I, in a very sneaky way, orchestrated the day perfectly. I woke up early. I cleaned the kitchen. I took the dogs for a walk. I sang Linda a song, a sonnet. Ha ha, my beauty. I did everything I needed to do. I orchestrated everything perfectly. And just at the moment where she said, oh, darling, I need to go out to run some errands, I said, oh, jolly, look at that. There's this perfect gap in the matrix there's this perfect moment between 11 and 1, darling, that if you go to do some grocery shopping during this time, when you come back, I'll give you a back rub and a feet massage. How does that sound? Perfect. Great. I got away with it. I've created a two-hour window to watch glorious rugby. And they had the little timer on the thing. Four, three, two, one. Do, 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 do. And then it said, there is currently a problem with your stream. <laughs> There is, a, <laughs> there is a problem with the stream. There is a problem with the stream. And I'm literally sitting there, and I start feeling itchy. You know what I mean? And, now, and, I, and I just need to tell you this. This is a guy who's been looking at anger for a week and what ungodly anger looks like. I'm sitting there watching this TV not work, and I get scratchy on the back of my eyeball. And I'm like, I just want to pour acid into my brain right now because I'm feeling really agitated right now that this is not working Good news is this. It started working one minute before everybody came home from grocery shopping. Hey, we're back. Delete. Live stream comes on. Now, am I being persecuted? No. <laughs> is the whole world against me? No. Did I feel like the whole world was against me? Did I feel persecuted? Did I actually go down a whole hole where I was like, of course, of course this happened to me. Of course. It doesn't happen to anybody else. Nobody else loses internet. I'm the only guy in the world that this happens to. And I started getting edgy, right? It's in those moments where we feel like we have to justify ourselves and we feel like we have to regain control where our anger can quickly overspill into sin. So I want to give you two thoughts this morning that are so powerful. And, you know, I think just because we say things in church a lot, Sometimes I think it can lose, it, lose its effectiveness because we say it and we hear it so much that it sort of becomes white noise. But there's nothing more powerful than this. There's two things I want you to know, and I believe that this will help you with your anger. Two beliefs. The first one is this. God is in control. Therefore, I do not need to be. How amazing is that actually? If you, th if you really dive into that, and if you really lean into it, I've got good news for you this morning. You don't have to be in control of everything. The McFlurry machine doesn't have to work every time you go to the McFlurry machine. Everything in the world does not have to revolve around you because God is in control, and He is good, and He loves you, and He has a plan for your life. So in those moments where it feels like we're losing control, I'm losing it, Jerry, I'm losing it, in those moments we need to all come all the way back to, I don't need to be in control. You know why I don't need to be in control? Because He is, and He is good, and He is powerful, and He is awesome. Romans 8, 28 verse, to verse 31, it says this, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. 
What then shall we say in response to all of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is in control, then we don't need to lose our cool every time we lose control. It's not about that. Second thing I want you to hold on to in those moments of frustration. Number one, God is in control, therefore I don't need to be. Number two, God is my judge and he has forgiven me, therefore I can forgive others. God is my judge. He is my judge. I do not need to defend myself to anybody at any moment, at any time. I don't have to justify my existence. I don't need to defend myself. I don't need to come up with all kinds of little weird arguments. I don't have to fight with anybody at the grocery store. I don't need to solidify myself because God is my judge and he has forgiven me. And now that he has forgiven me, he's put me in the position where I can actually forgive others. Listen to this. This is one of the most powerful portions of Scripture Luke 23, verses 34, and this is when Jesus is being crucified. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, you and me, for they do not know what they are doing, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Jesus is our judge, and he has forgiven us, and that mercy now that we have received should put us in a place where every time we feel threatened, Every time we feel the need to fight, every time we feel the need to justify ourselves, let's lean into the truth that He is our judge. He has forgiven us. Now we've been set free to forgive others. Last thing I want to leave you with this morning is this. If you are a child of God, I want you to know that God is not angry with you. If you are a child of God, I want you to know that God is not angry with you. Jeremiah 25, verse 15. This is what the Lord God of Israel said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath, says the Lord, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. God is speaking to Jeremiah and he is saying that he is angry. He is filled with wrath about sin and the sin in the world. He's talking about his cup of wrath. And then look at what happens here. Matthew 26, verses 39. Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He's about to go to the cross. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. What cup is he talking about? He's talking about the cup of God's wrath and God's judgment and God's anger. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And as Jesus goes to the cross, he essentially consumes, he drinks, he eats all of God's anger, all of God's judgment, all of God's wrath gets consumed by Christ so that now you and I can live in peace with God. I want you to stand up with me this morning. Jesus consumes God's anger on our behalf so that now we can be in peace with the Lord.